Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. I think you're in for a real uh, special uh, treat uh, with our guest speaker. I'm Jerry Stewart, President of Oklahoma City Community College, and it's my honor today to host this event. But really, the credit for this event does not go to me or my office. It goes to Dr. Sharon Vaughn, Professor of Political Science, who conceived the visit, planned it, executed it, made it happen. So, uh, Dr. Vaughn, would you please stand and let us say thank you. I cannot think of a more appropriate time to have Dr. James Marone, a distinguished political scientist, to speak to us today about the 2016 presidential election. I want to thank all those who helped uh, arrange his visit here today. Professor Marone is a nationally renowned political scientist and an award-winning author well known for his Pulitzer Prize nominated book, Hellfire Nation. I'm reading it now, Professor. He earned his undergraduate degree from Middlebury College and his master's and PhD from the University of Chicago. He is the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Brown University and a five-time recipient of the Hazelton Citation for Outstanding Teaching. Dr. Marone served as president of the Politics and History Section of the American Political Science Association and the New England Political Science Association. He has been on the board of editors for eight scholarly journals has authored more than 150 articles and essays, and has contributed to the New York Times, the London Review of Books, and the American Prospect. Currently, he is the chair of, Brown University fac of the Brown University faculty, and he also serves as the director of the Brown Public Policy Center. Today's lecture, the 2016 election in context, the familiar, the unusual and the bizarre is the, the title of the lecture today. Please welcome Professor Marone to Oklahoma City Community College. Oh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Thanks so much. Well, what a pleasure it is to be here. Thank you for coming out. This is a, an amazing turnout. And I'm particularly, I'm not just saying thank you. I've just finished revising the textbook that you've read, and you sit in a room in an office, and you just try to imagine who's going to read this thing. So it's really nice to actually see some faces of people who, whether you like it or not, are reading the textbook. So let's get down to this. Oh, wait, first I have to do a little social science. Just want to see who my audience is. Sorry, I can't see you up in the balcony. I want to know who you voted for. If you voted, and if you didn't vote because you're too young, I want to know who you would have voted for. Your choices are uh, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, other, and I don't give a damn. <laughs> How many Hillary Clinton voters? Okay, quite a few. How many Donald Trump voters? A uh, pretty mixed group, I would say about 40%. How about other? Oh, uh, Stein? No, just one Stein. Okay, so we know it's libertarian, other. And do not give a damn. <laughs> All right, you're the audience I have to convince. All right, here we go. Let's figure out, I'll give you the quick roadmap of where we're going. Uh, first, the first, um, the first stirrings, we knew something was up uh, when the earthquake hit New Hampshire in the New Hampshire election. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the race. Then I want to get to the results. First, why did Trump win? I'll give you four reasons. Then I want to pull back a little and look at what this election tells us about America. And I'll try to say something that makes you uncomfortable, regardless of when you put your hand up. So what it means, again, I'm going to give you four reasons. I don't know why this lecture fell into fours. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the four possible President Trumps. That is, what his future is going to look like. There's four possibilities, some great, some awful. Uh, as with any president, there's lots of possibilities. And finally, the conclusion when I come back to you. All right, here we go. A year before this all happened, 
we were cruising to an absolutely normal election. And what you see on the slide is the, uh, is the newspaper reports that Governor Bush had, uh, had raised an unbelievable amount of money. And right behind him was Hillary Clinton. So we all settled in. Not going to be too hard to revise my textbook. Standard item. The party elites were like, okay, this is cool. We got Hillary, we know who she is, sort of like her. She knows the levers of government. And we got Governor Bush, hey, he's a good, you know, good guy. Um, so everybody's happy. And then the voting began. Here's New Hampshire. This is when we knew we were in for a wild ride. Red is Trump. And except for a few little blue dots, those little blue towns are rhinos at Dartmouth College. They all voted for Kasich. But throw them aside, because that's not real New Hampshire, and it's all red. The green is Sanders. You see, Hillary won two towns. Count them, two towns. Um, and she won them by like three votes. And all of a sudden, we knew we were in for a wild ride. And the wild ride is certainly what we got. Forward a little bit to the election. These are the polls. Not just the polls, but the people who know about polls, who put it all together and tell us what the probability of winning is. And these are the different experts. So they range, as you see, from 99% sure that Hillary will win to um, uh, the really cautious what is it, 71%. And uh, the Huffington Post people, you see them at 98% sure that Hillary's going to win. The week before the election, they wrote a, someone wrote a column in the Huffington Post denouncing the, um, the 538 people, they're the Fox with the 71%, because they said, what 29% what chance of Trump winning? The, the guy has drunk Kool-Aid. And they attacked him. So all the polls wrong about this election. And, um, you know, in a way that's never happened before. There's only one comparable election. In the 1948 election, we didn't really have good polls then, but we did have very savvy newspaper people who traveled with the president and, the, uh, and, the, and his challenger. There were 50 well-known guys, and they took a poll. They had never been wrong, and they went 50 to zero for Dewey. And Truman heard this, and he said, ah, they don't, they don't have it. He was, you know, he was a, a good Missouri practical guy. He said, they don't have enough sense to stomp a hole when they see a rattler. I don't know what it means. Maybe you do. But that's how, and he won, of course, despite, that's the only comparable election. So everybody got this wrong. Here's the dirty, rotten secret. We don't know much, really, about what makes a, a, a winning election. Here's the way to put it. In the last 100 years, 16 men, alas, Hillary supporters, I still have to say 16 men, 16 men have won the presidency. That's not a whole lot. You can't build a whole lot of theory on just 16 people. So, and that's in 100 years. So the problem is we have what we say a small N. We just don't have very many cases. So if it's a very typical election, no problem. The election between Bush and Clinton, that would have been easy. But when Donald Trump came on, all bets were off. Ah, so first thing to say, we knew there was trouble in New Hampshire. Second thing to say, boy, did we miss this one. We all missed it. We all got this wrong. All the polls were wrong. Third thing to say, if there was a rule about campaigning, Donald Trump broke it, stomped on it, and kicked it out the door. You name it, he didn't do it. You're supposed to build a ground game. Everybody knows you need a ground game. You need people knocking on doors. No, you've got to raise money. Everybody knows you've got to raise money. No, don't insult people. No, tack to the middle. No, you name it. There's another 10 rules, he broke them all. And we kept saying, he can't win. He doesn't have a ground game. He can't win. He hasn't raised any money. And he won. So this is going to go down. We will be studying this election for as long as I'm around, maybe even as long as you're around. All right, here's the results. Read them, weep, cheer. Notice this striking fact, by the way, if you just arrived here from, say, I don't know, France, um, you, Hillary won. She won by, um, the count I have got up there is, um, is the count as of yesterday morning, but now they're saying she's gonna win by more than a million and a half votes. So you're from another country, you say, wait, a democracy, she won, but she didn't win. Um, she didn't win the popular votes, and strikingly so. Um, so there's, 
there's, there's the result. Um, and we've got we to figure out what exactly caused this result that made us so, so wrong about what was happening. So let's get to part two. I've already mentioned that Trump broke all the rules, that we were completely wrong about this, and that there are your results. But why? Why is it that Donald Trump managed to stun everyone and win? And I'm going to give you four reasons. And the first one is the Electoral College. There it is stretched out so you, um, you can see exactly how uh, each state counts. It looks a little different, doesn't it? Oklahoma suddenly is not quite as big as it used to be on the regular map. Um, by the way, I, I've got, as a political scientist, I'm required to say this, why the Electoral College? And the answer is pretty interesting. If, um, uh, if you read the first page, James Madison, who basically wrote the Constitution, kept meticulous notes at the Constitutional Convention. So we know what everybody said. He was wise enough, incidentally, to keep it private for 25 years when everyone uh, was past the scene. And that was an important thing because during the debate on whether or not to accept the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton was arguing for it. You know Hamilton, right? You know the musical at least. Hamilton is arguing for it in New York and his opponent says, well, at the Constitutional Convention, because his opponent had been there before he left in a huff, this man stood up and asked for the president to be elected for life, which was true. And if people had known that, New York would have been. They only passed the Constitutional Convention by two votes anyway in New York. That would have been it. So what does Hamilton do? He does something he probably should have done less of. He said, that's a lie, and if you say it again, I'll challenge you to a duel. And so his opponent, his opponent said, well, uh, okay, okay, and he backs off. But when Madison's notes come uh, forward and we see what they are, absolutely true, he said it. So we know what they said at the Constitution from Madison's notes. Um, and what Madison tells us about the Electoral College is they couldn't decide. They didn't trust anybody. So they knew the people weren't ready to be voting for that. that in fact, the first day they were all complaining about the people are the, are the victims of pretended patriots and their dupes and we, we shouldn't have them too involved. State legislatures, nah, they didn't like the state legislatures. And uh, if you served in a state legislature, you know why to this day. Um, Congress, nah, they didn't trust Congress. So what were they gonna do? They said, well, let's set up an electoral college and we'll elect electors and they'll elect the president. Well, who picks the electors? Uh, I don't know, let the states decide. So they never decided. And they weren't too upset about it because they figured everybody's gonna vote for George Washington for a couple of terms, and then we'll figure it out as we go along. So it was sort of like this, we don't trust anybody, let's have an electoral college. There'll be people like us, big people. And so there we have this electoral college. I'm sorry I went into that in so much detail, but it's, you know, we political scientists. Um, so the electoral college here that's what it looks like, that's how it was. And it's a striking thing, the Electoral College, in this, in this election. Um, first, two out of the last three presidents entered office despite getting a minority of the votes of the people of the country. Striking thing for a democracy. Second, a few squeaker states moved this election. Clinton lost, Trump won Michigan by 12,000 votes. By the way, the people in Detroit turned out, big Democratic stronghold, 70,000 less than last time. Wisconsin, 27,000 votes. Pennsylvania, 68,000 votes, 1.2%. So here's a bunch of states where it was very, very close. In California, on the other hand, Clinton wins, Trump wins by 12, 27, 68, and the three states that put him over, in California, Clinton wins by three million votes. Well, guess what? That's 200,900,000 wasted votes when you come to the Electoral College. So we've got this strange system put in place by the founders because they couldn't figure out what to do because they couldn't quite decide who to pick for president. Um, and now that is clearly organized in a way that is a deficit that makes things more difficult for Democrats. So the first thing to say is the, elect the Electoral College is shaped funny right now or inefficiently if you're a Democrat. Second, oh by the way, the if you're sitting there and you're a Trump supporter, you're saying, ah, I love this, this guy's great, Electoral College, you're my baby. Let me just say, 
things keep changing. You wouldn't believe how fast things change in American politics. This is a particularly dire moment, the most dire in the last 28 years for Democrats. Michael Dukakis running against George Herbert Walker Bush. I want you to notice one thing. Notice that um, when the Democrats are at low ebb, what states can they be sure of? West Virginia they can be sure of. Um, Michigan they can be sure of. Two states that we, the Democrats just lost. And West Virginia is one of the three most Republican states in the union now. From the most Democratic, Democrats would always count them, to most Republican. You got something on the other side? Sure, California. California was red in 1988 as it had been in seven out of the last eight presidential elections. Now, good luck finding a Republican in California. So things change. So whatever side you're on, don't get too comfortable because it's going to change and it'll change dramatically. Second, why Clinton lost and, um, and Trump won? The turnout. The turnout was huge, uh, or rather the turnout was not huge. It was too small for the Democrats. Look at this turnout in 2008, 2012, 2016. Notice what you see. The winner this time, well, Clinton won the popular vote, but both Clinton and Trump got fewer votes than Romney, much less Ob than Obama. That is to say turnout is very low. Or to put it a little bit more sharply, Republicans turned out their base largely white people, as I'll say in a moment, Democrats failed to turn out their base. Uh, millions and millions of people came out, of course, but 90 million people who were eligible did not. And that helps explain this outcome uh, in many ways. That is to say, again, just to emphasize the point, the Republicans were excited, oops, falling off the stage, were excited about their, uh, their candidate. The Democrats were not excited about their Democrat. And that's, that's what this chart really shows. Third, what caused Clinton to lose and tr Trump to win? The official Democratic line is James Comey. And here's how the line goes. It was a tougher election than we thought, but we were rolling. We were rolling. In fact, 10 days before the election, we were beginning to shift money from our campaign to states like Arizona, where we were hoping to knock off a Republican senator, uh, John McCain, and win in the House of Representatives. When, that, when Comey said, I'm looking at the emails again, and not just looking at the emails, but looking at Anthony Weiner's emails. Anthony Weiner, Mr. Sexting. It, oh. And the Clinton people said, you could just feel the, the air come out of the balloon. And the Trump people, if you watch Trump a few days before that, he was getting pretty despondent. And this fit his narrative. What he been saying, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. Well, this it was it. So, Every campaign tries to paint a narrative of the other candidate, and the Trump narrative was vindicated by, uh, by James Comey. Um, and then two days before the election, um, the Comey comes out and says, ah, it's, um, it, uh, there's nothing there. And the Clinton people say, that actually made it worse, because they remind, oh, yeah, yeah, there's just one thing after another, just like Donald says. We do know, data, we do know that people who said they decided in the last week that they voted really in large numbers, over 60% for Trump. So there's some reason to believe the story. On the other hand, the few polls who got this right, that kept saying, you know, Trump is doing pretty well, they didn't change over this period. So if you look at the Los Angeles Times poll, this crazy outlier, everybody said, what's wrong with the Los Angeles Times? They look at these cute people in Los Angeles, don't know how to do polling. Well, they got it right. And they don't show any big difference. So if you're a Clinton supporter, you'll feel a little better. You may as well believe it was the damn FBI that if you're a Trump supporter, think no, it was something else. And that's something else really um, is populism. Number four is populism. Populism is the surge of American citizens who've grown sick and tired of the system as usual. It occurs in regular intervals in American history. And America is set up for populism because founding fathers, again, they set up a system that's very unresponsive. 
I want health insurance. I elect someone who get, want, get, is going to give me health insurance. Promises. They get to Congress, boom, it doesn't happen. Or it doesn't happen the way I want. It's a very uh, difficult system to move. Populism is the canary in the gold, coal mine that says, hey guys, we've had enough of this, let's change. You, 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 uh, you ignore populism in the United States at your peril. The fourth explanation for why Donald Trump won is he captured this popular spirit. And we should not be surprised, there was the Tea Party. That was populism on stilts. Um, we should have seen this coming. Occupy Wall Street. Did you have an Occupy Oklahoma City? There were a lot of Occupies anyway. Um, or Black Lives Matter. We had populism coming out the ears. So it did look like a populist year. A reason explanation number four, populism coming big time to, to, to American politics. So here are my four explanations of why Trump won. One, the electoral college. If you're a Democrat, I now uh, uh, permit you to say, despite my reverence for the founding fathers, the crazy electoral college. Uh, Hamilton brags about it. it's the one thing everybody can agree on um, in, about the Constitution, and back then they could. But anyway, the Electoral College, turnout. Democrats did not turn out their people in large enough numbers. Third, the FBI at a very bad moment. And fourth, the surge of people, of populism. I, I kept hearing again and again, oh, Trump doesn't have a ground game. And as I was driving, I'm a voter in New Hampshire, and I was driving uh, to New Hampshire, and um, every overpass, uh, as you go up this, uh, Route 93, had a guy in a cap, make America great again, and a vote Trump sign. And they were waving, they were smiling, they did not look scary. And um, I thought, wait, wait, I thought Trump didn't have a ground game. These weren't like a ground game, these were people who cared so much, they got in touch with each other by email and, uh, and Facebook, rather, uh, email, you can tell how old I am. Um, you get, get together on Facebook and, um, and, and, and they, they stood there. And, you, and I, as, as I drove up, we were talking about when you first knew, I thought, oh, maybe the ground game doesn't matter because we have a populist revolution. So I told you about the election itself, how we got it wrong, how Trump broke all the rules. Um, how we thought we were going to have a traditional election, but then we had a very surprising one. I then talked about why Clinton lost and Trump won. I want to pull back now and tell you what I think this means for, for American politics. Um, went too fast. The first thing to say is that we are an incredibly divided country. Um, I can't help but note that you have to drive a rather long way to find a blue spot on that map if you start in Oklahoma City. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you have to drive a long way to find a red spot on the map. Most people are not living with people who don't agree with them. Um, and they're so different. It's not just the map. You know, uh, I've got the data there. Uh, they've been asking people for a long time, um, would you be very upset if your child's married a Democrat or Republican? Back in, um, uh, and you can see the data there, today 48% are saying they're very upset um, if 49%, um, 49% 49 are saying I'd be very upset. Um, that's a lot of people. If you ask, do you want to live in a city or in the country, 4% of conservatives say they'd like to live in a city, and only 10% of Democrats, of liberals, want to live in the country. And believe me, they're just talking about their second homes on Cape Cod, so you don't have to. <laughs> um, so we've got a very, you know, it's like the old Italian joke, you know, I, I, I hate to sort of, well, I'm just going to go ahead. If, if this is out of line, wave your hands, and I won't say any more stories like this, but um, it's like the old Italian joke of the little girl who comes home and says, Mommy, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. What? I, I want to be a, a prostitute. Oh, thank heavens. I thought you said you wanted to be a Protestant. For Protestant, <laughs> simply put in Democrat or Republican. So we're a very divided, very divided society. Now, this is all new to have a society that's this divided, have the parties this divided. It used to be there'd always be a majority party and a minority party. And the majority party would say what went, and the minority party went along. 
But now we have two very, very close uh, sides, and there is no majority. So just think back two weeks ago, Democrats thought they might win the House, the Senate, and the presidency. But no, the Republicans won the House, the Senate, and the presidency. When you have that year in and year out, which is what we've had since 1980, if you have that year in and year out, it corrodes any effort to work together. Because both sides think, if we just make the other guys look like idiots, we can win it all next time. And that's been happening since 1980, a long time to go. So, two sides, um, very divided, don't even live together, um, uh, going across the United States, uh, and each side hoping to break through. Now, here's the lesson from history. In historical terms, one side always does break through. So here's the great question about this election. I'll come back to it in a moment. But is this the breakthrough of one side? You see, the election itself might be very close, but um, we're Republican all the way down. Now, I know it looks that way in Oklahoma, but it, now it even looks that way in Vermont, which just elected a Republican governor. That's a map of the states, the big map, uh, and it shows you where the Republicans control both houses of the Congress, of the legislature, and the governorship. Um, where do the Democrats have? Let's see, they've got the West Coast, check. Uh, any place else you can see? Oh, Rhode Island, check. And Delaware, that's it. Now, so is this the beginning of the end for a democratic hope of majority? Just you be in the minority party, guys, get along. So that's one possibility. And when you look at this, it certainly looks that way. Uh, Senate, House, Presidency, and almost all the state legislatures, but something interesting. If you look at the little map I put in, that's what it looked like at the end of the Bush era. It was all Democrats. The Democrats owned most of the state houses. The Republicans were down to places like, well, Oklahoma. And, um, and if you go back to the beginning of the Bush era, when Clinton was coming out of office, it was all Republican. So here's two possibilities. One. Trump has swept the popular vote in, and the Republicans are now going to take over. Fasten your seatbelt. If you're a Democrat, get used to being in a minority. The other argument is it's always a pendulum. Clinton is a Democrat. He's in power. They all go re re uh, Republican. Uh, Bush comes in. They all go Democrat because each party overreaches. And people who lose get more pissed than people who win get happy. So that's the big question. Are we in the middle of a pendulum and it's coming back the other way? Or is it a Republican era? And that's what we're going to find out in the next three years. So we may be at a historic watershed for the United States. Okay. Um, a second thing it means is both parties have to decide who they are. Um, and I'll just say a word about this. Two weeks ago, we thought the Republican Party was in for an incredible bed, uh, bloodbath because it was three different parties. It was the rich, powerful people who loved immigration, who loved foreign trade deals, who um, loved tax cuts, and who hated Donald Trump. But they supplied all the money for the party, and they always won. It was the evangelicals who actually eventually came around to Trump but feel like they always lose on cultural issues. Some of you are there, are out there, know exactly what I mean. Whether it's abortion or same-sex marriage or this or that, you've lost. And so pissed off at the first group, hoping Donald Trump will change the Supreme Court enough to finally give you some victories. And then there's a third group, the populists, who don't really care that much about evangelicals and certainly don't care about foreign trade deals and immigration. Or rather, they're not for it, they're against it. And they've been in this party that's been dominant and they finally took it over. Now, which of those is going to come forward in the Republican Party? We don't know. We'll see how it comes out. When I give you the four Donald Trumps, we'll, we'll get back to that. The Democrats were really enjoying the Republican brawl until they lost. There's three Democratic parties. There is the party of the middle, the center left, as it's called. And there are people who say, hey, we need the donors. Hey, we need Wall Street. We need the financiers. Let's go the middle route. Left, but middle left. This is Bill and Hillary. And then there's the Sanders supporters. They're the left progressives. They tend to be white. And what they tend to look at is 
politics as mobilization on the left. Can we be more like Denmark? Can we do something about inequality? Can we have national health insurance, real national health insurance? And then there's a civil rights caucus. You know, we don't care that much about your specific policies. What we really want is social justice. Social justice for immigrants, social justice for African Americans, social justice for women, that's where we are. And that right now looks like it's moving into majority status in the Democratic Party. One indicator, um, the Democratic caucus in Congress is the first one to have a minority white males. First time in history, really a quite remarkable thing. Um, so, number one, um, well, let me get to question number, question number three. Let's talk about the, um, about the elephant in the room. I found so many slides on the internet about elephants in the room. Um, so let's, let's get to that. I've already said the United States is incredibly divided. I've already said that both parties are trying to decide exactly who they are. And now we get to really the heart of the matter. And that is race and immigration. Donald Trump, love him or hate him, was ferocious in his talk about this. And his methodology is not to hire a pollster, it's to tell people stuff. And if they cheer, he tells it to them again, and he tells it to them louder. And if they don't like it, he says, don't like that, huh? Okay, off it goes. So he's constantly road testing what, he, what, what he's going to say. And what he found was that the immigration issue got the biggest roar. And so he ran with it. Now, let's begin to look a little more carefully. Here is the immigration line in American history. And there's something very interesting here. Between the 1920s and 1965, we shut the immigrant door, by and large. And you could see the line going down. And so by 1965, everybody thought of immigrants as, oh, yeah, my grandparents. Yeah, they came over from Italy. Oh, so nice. Yeah. Uh, tomato sauce. Yeah, it's great. Pasta. Super. And so Democrats started pushing, let's, let's let immigrants in again, because it was great. And there you see the picture, the signing. There weren't even hearings. He says, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Everybody's for it. And so they just signed, they opened the gates. No one even thought about it. Yeah, it's not going to change America. Right. But it did change America. You could see that line going up. Every time there's lots of immigration, there's an immigration backlash. It's always happened in American history, and it's happening now. Here's a second thing that's happening, elephant in the room. This is the vote among Democrats, among white people for Democrats. There's another bar there that I didn't have time to add from 39, 37% for Hillary Clinton if exit polls are right. By two to one, Democrats, I'm sorry, white people do not vote for the Democratic Party. Why? Well, one explanation, there's two explanations here. Um, one, if you're a Democrat, you say, yeah, because we bought, we bit the bullet and we were brave, not just brave, we were heroic during the civil rights struggle, and we've been punished for that. So that's the Democratic line. If you're a Republican, you say, you know what? We voted for the civil rights bill as much as you, but you guys went too far. There were riots in the cities. There were, there's the Boston busing crisis, where Boston was told, well, you never had discrimination per se, but you have to bus kids so they're integrated in schools. And you can see the riots. And what the Republicans say to the Democrats is you pushed it too far like most parties in power. And there, there's that story. And we came along with a very genial, popular man who said, hey, let's, let's pull back from this whole civil rights thing. And the genial, popular man, that's Ronald Reagan, in case you don't recognize him, said to a lot of people, hey, come to my party. You know, we, we'll be a little party of a little less upset. And so we have this really quite remarkable thing in America of having the elephant in the room, went back too far, of having white people vote mainly for the Republicans. That one spurt up there is Jimmy Carter in 1976 in the post-Watergate election. There's Ronald Reagan again. And so here is the results. The Republican Party has become a party of white people. Not only there's 10% of its vote, 12% of its vote, 13% of the vote, but by and large, white people are drawn to the the Republican Party. Most Republicans think, well, we have to do something about this. We can do something about this. We will do something about this. Trump seemed to say something different. But the problem is, there's the white vote. It's going down. 
It's going down by 2% every election. That's why Hillary was a lock to win, by the way. Sooner or later, you have to get the non-white vote if you're a Republican, and you know that. And so this has complicated everything. Now, what's different is something, something new. So you can come to me and say, oh, Professor, look, look, Jim, um, there's been racism, there's been nativism. It goes all the way back to 1800. So what, what's so special about now? And I'll tell you what. Here's a cartoon from the, uh, from the 1880s, and each side was making fun of a group from the other side. So the Democrats, the, the Democrats made fun of the freed blacks who were all voting for the Republicans. And the Republicans made fun of the Irishmen who they didn't want in this country because they were all voting Democratic. And so each side had a group that nativists hated one group, racists hated another group, and they were spread out among the party. Even Lincoln had nativists in his, uh, on his team. The old know-nothings came over to Lincoln. What's new now is that one party has the white folks and one party has, by and large, people of color. Now, I told you elections change. This could all be different in the next election, but it's something to keep your eyes on in the future because of this chart. Or to put it differently, and here's the punchline to this point, um, the United States is rapidly becoming majority minority. It is a country that will no longer have a white majority in a very short time. When will there be a non-white majority? Well, for people under 18, next year. Next year. For people under 35, in 11 years. For everyone, in 27 years. So here is a demographic revolution unlike any we've ever seen, and it's going to change America, and we're not even wrapping our heads around it. So. What will the parties do about this? We are coming to majority, minority. There's the numbers I just cited for you. And each party is going to have to come to terms with that. Doesn't mean Republicans are always going to lose because who votes for each party changes all the time. But it does suggest that Trump's path to victory will only last so long. Okay, so one last point about what it all means and then I'll do just one last section and I'll quit so we can get to questions and answers. Um, rising inequality. Here are the numbers for what America looked like in 1970. Uh, it's something called the Gini Index. So if one means um, we all have exactly the same amount of money, I'm sorry, zero means we all have exactly the same amount of money. One means the president has all the money um, and the rest of us have zero. So we go between uh, zero is completely equal, one is completely unequal. You can see the United States at 35, 35.8. It was kind of like a European nation in 1970. Political scientists complained anyway, but it was pretty egalitarian, uh, pretty equal. Here it is today. It has dropped nine points in equality. To put this most starkly, we are now closer on the inequality tables to Lesotho, the most unequal country on earth, than we are to Denmark, the equalist country on earth. We have had vast inequality come our way. So there's something that's gonna shake up the electorate huge, big time. So here are three things. We have a divided nation split down the middle, 50-50 even. Second, the parties are changing. Third, race and immigration is changing America. We will be a majority minority. What does this election mean for that? Fourth, this inequality, these inequality numbers are huge and they've shaken everything up. And by the way, let me go back to that um, inequality table. Um, notice how most other countries, I've got the numbers in green, minus means there's less inequality than there was in 1970, plus means there's more. Most countries have seen less inequality in the last 50 years. The United States has let it go through the roof. That's something we're really going to have to worry about, think about. So there's a lot to digest here, but again, keep these four points in mind as you think about what this election tells us. We are divided. The parties are both up for grabs. What are they going to stand for in the future? We're becoming a majority minority country, and inequality has grown rampant. And that, I think, 
is what really affected the election. Donald Trump, you can agree with what he said, you can disagree with what he said, he talked about inequality. He talked about people left behind. Love Hillary Clinton, but love Trump's hate does not say anything about inequality. Okay, let's finish up by talking about the four Trump presidencies. There's four different things that could happen in the next couple of years. One, Trump becomes a traditional Republican. He sits down with, um, with Paul Ryan, pictured there, with Mitch McConnell, not pictured. Uh, maybe his wife gets in, and they have conversations. Ryan says, here's what I'd like to do, here's what we ought to do, and uh, Trump either agrees or disagrees, and they have a quite conventional Republican administration. We can see cuts in taxes, uh, we can see all kinds of um, fairly traditional unity Republicans. They'll do something on infrastructure, they'll do something on markets for health care, um, they will be less regulation, less environmental stuff, they will not overreach and this will be Republicans successfully running the country in a traditional Republican way. Could happen. Republican the insurgent, nah, he's not gonna let go. He's gonna keep doing what he's been doing. And this is his chance, I think, to be a really transformational president. His steady commentary to his base, keeps talking to his base. Uh, he will think of all kinds of programs he wants to do and muscle and humiliate and terrorize Congress into passing them. It'll be America first, there'll be sphere of influence, there'll be all kinds of changes, but most important, he will constantly make this cultural commentary to his followers. He'll tweet them at three in the morning throughout his presidency. If he does this and does it successfully, he could be transformational because there's all this populist anger Presidents who manage to bottle that populism and lead it and run it become transformational presidents. So if you're wearing a Make America Great hat, what you want to see Trump do is exactly what Obama didn't do. Obama also came on a wave of change, on a wave of populism, and he decided, I'm going to disband my network of followers and try to play with Congress. He played an insider's game and disaster ensued. Trump could learn the lesson from Obama and keep his grassroots roiling. And if he can continue to, to get their support and maybe extend it to people who feel left behind, he could be very successful and powerful indeed. By the way, anybody can play this game. I'm just saying what might happen in the future. You can do this too. So start thinking yourself, what's your fifth uh, Trump presidency? But I got two more. Um, Ah, the white nationalist. Here's something a lot of people are worried about. He could go another way. He could double, triple, quadruple down on the white nationalism that some of his supporters have liked so much. And that would be a very different, subtly different, but very different difference than, the, um, than continuing, continuing the movement going. Um, crack down harder, there are demonstrations. Crack down, use the federal power to crack down on the demonstrators. Government often provokes uh, responses from civil society, and you can imagine that happening here. Uh, oops, the white nationalists. There they are waving Confederate flags. The white nationalists, people who believe in a white America, as their numbers diminish, by the way, as you, as you just heard me say, people who believe that come forward and he embraces them. This is the night white nationalist Trump. He's shown signs of it. He's refused to repudiate people who are white nationalists. And white nationalists have really mobilized about this. I don't know if you read, but New Balance is the new shoes of the white nationalists. Never mind why. But this is, uh, this is a whole story. Um, and that's a possible Trump. He will be remembered not as a great president, that's the last one, but as a terrible president if this comes forward, I believe, unless there's a constitutional crisis. The great fear of this Donald Trump is that he won't listen to anybody. He says, oh, you can't do that. Constitution says no. He says, but they always tell me not to do it. They told me not to make speeches. They told me not to insult John McCain. They told me not to insult the, uh, the beauty queen. I insulted them all I won. I'm not going to listen to you. And what happens if he pushes that? I'm going to run for a third term. Ah, they told me not to do it. I'm going to do it. What now? Do Republicans get a line behind a third term? Violate the Constitution? That's the fear that the libertarians are feeling. Um, and then, of course, 
there's always the potential. Donald Trump can't organize his way out of anything. He, he can't organize an election. He can't organize a, um, a, uh, a convention. He's going to have a hard time organizing. The great danger, if you're a Trump fan, is that he just first president with no experience in the public sector at all. So there is always the danger that it'll just be chaos, that his people will leave him and then we'll have four years of a president who doesn't seem to know what he's doing with the press constantly harking on him. So here's four entirely different Donald Trumps, the traditional Republican, which I thought up till a day ago was the most likely. I still think I would bet on that. And then it's a question of how Republican policies sell. The insurgent, I think there'll be some of this, and this is his path to being an extraordinarily influential. He, he does what he's good at. He comments about the world to people in ways they understand in the form of a tweet. And if he reinterprets America and its role in the world, he will be a great president. Um, if he's a white nationalist, he will be a terrifying president. And you know we're a very diverse community here, and whether you're blue or red or don't give a damn like you guys don't care, um, we certainly want to embrace one another as a community. Um, and finally, every presidency faces this danger that they'll get in and they'll be clueless. And a lot of Democrats are hoping that that's what they'll see out of Donald Trump. I'll just say one last word in closing, and that is what I've given you is a whole bunch of ways, not just that we went, but that we're going. And I've tried to think about this election and what it means about our future. The uh, division, the changing racial demographics, the changing inequality, and so forth. And what that really means is something that gives me a great deal of confidence. It means the future is in your hands. It means the millennial generation, which is very, very different, is the generation that's going to decide all the questions I've raised. We can already see it happening. You may have noticed that marijuana in many states, not Oklahoma, has become legal because American public opinion changed. Wrong. American public opinion didn't change. If you're over 65, you never liked marijuana, you still don't like marijuana. But as the millennials came online, they were like, yeah, oh yeah, 80%. And everybody just looks at the final results, oh, yeah, it changed. Uh, uh, politics is changing. Same-sex marriage, same thing. It's not that people change their minds, it's that the millennials came online with different attitudes. So now you have to sit back and realize that in a very real way, and I mean in a very real way, the future is not with people like your teachers and like me. It's with you guys. What you decide, what you do in your life will matter maybe just in a little community around you, but as we add the U's up across America, it's your future, it's your decision. And as I meet more and more of my students, as more and more millennials come along, I think, God, these are great people. They volunteer, they have good values, they just look at the world, whether they're blue or red or Democrat or Republic, I'm just always admiring of them. There's just one problem. There's a few too many who raise their hands when you ask, Electoral politics, oh, I don't give a damn. It's just so corrupt. And so my last plea is to say, don't raise your hand when we say you don't care. Care about this, because there's an awful lot at stake. And it is really, really up to you. Thank you so much for having me. Oops, where's my... Ah, I need, I've got a thank you slide. Thank you. Wait, I want to take your picture. Oh, we should do Q&A. Do we have time? Oh, great. But don't leave yet. I want to take your picture. <laughs> While the microphone, is there a microphone going around? Oh, great. Thank you. Wow, that is a responsive audiovisual team. <laughs> There's a light shining here, so uh, now you can't see me, but I can see you. Great. I know, I should take a movie. All right. <laughs> Now I can see who asked me the tough questions. Uh, there, there's someone right there. Oh, two people. To what extent do you think that the United States prioritization of race over class affected this election? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, 
So that is something that has been bedeviling both parties. Bernie Sanders ran on class, right? And the Democratic Party, the white progressive Democratic Party said, yes, absolutely. And the Civil Rights Caucus said, no, that race is toxic in a way class is not. So a lot of Democrats, not a lot, a few intelligent Democrats are saying exactly what you're saying. Is race is so difficult. Immigration is so difficult. Let's just talk about rich versus poor. Or let's just talk about people who are super rich uh, uh, as opposed to everyone else. That Trump managed to do uh, to some extent, although there was also obviously the race thing. Um, can both parties begin to put aside race? Now, this has been a dream of progressives, generation upon generation. Back the populists in Texas, back in the 1880s and 90s, used to say, the, 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 the white guy and the black guy, the white woman and the black guy, we're all in the ditch together. Let's, let's get together and, 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 and do those robber barons. Let's attack them. The problem is, so great question, uh, obvious answer, let's just talk about how well off you are and forget about all this racial stuff. Republicans have one set of solutions, Democrats have another set of solutions, and ironically, Trump brought the Republicans much closer to the Democrats. The problem is try telling a African-American truck driver that, oh yeah, you're just like a white truck driver. You're basically the same. It's just you're making the same income, right? So you're the same guy. Well, no. So there's something about the United States, and it may just be nothing more than a long history of slavery and immigration, but there's something about the United States that keeps turning questions into racial questions. So the short answer is that would be great if we could just talk about what kind of income profile do we want and stop judging people by the con color of their skin and start thinking only about the content of their character, Martin Luther King's great dream. Um, it doesn't, the great question, and I'll just leave it as a question, is it possible? I will say, if there's one generation that seems to be acting in a way that does make it possible, it's the millennials. If you look at interracial marriage among millennials, off the charts, in ways that uh, older generations could not imagine. And also, what's, what's race for millennials? I'll say one last thing. I'll answer a second question to your question. One of the great issues is gonna be what immigrants do. So the tradition of immigration, take my people, the Italians, they come uh, to the United States and they're treated like a racial minority that no one wants. And what did they do? They said, no, wait, 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 wait. We are white. We are white like you people. We're, we're, we're not dark, we're white. And they won their whiteness. If Latinos began to do that too, we're white, come on, um, and join the majority, we would have a very different politics than of Latinos, Asians, the largest growing group, and other groups said, you know what? This whole binary you people are into, I don't, I don't know, I don't like it. I don't know, what am I? I'm from Brazil, I actually grew up in Brazil. I'm from Brazil, I, I don't know what I am, I'm, not, I'm nothing. And then we go right to what you're suggesting. We go to income, we go to how well you're doing, we go to opportunity, and we stop talking about race. So there are inklings that your generation might actually be paying a lot less attention to coding people by the color of their skin. No generation before yours has even taken a little baby step in that direction. I won't say you're there, I'm saying you've actually taken steps in that direction. Long answer, I actually answered two questions, but uh, very good, I, from now on I'll answer just one. Uh, nice hat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Do you think Trump has the like, ability to take the rights away from the LGBT and the immigrants? It's a great question. Um, I don't think so. Um, I'll say a couple of things. One, we don't really know what Trump is gonna do. Two, I think most people in Washington, including Republicans, would like the whole LBGT thing to go away. And so they will sit on him very hard, why? 
because business is very clear. They don't want screwing around with that. You pass a law, they pull out the all-star game. You pass a law in, in North Carolina, they remove, uh, they, they remove investment from your state. They don't want to deal with it because they don't think the young generation wants it dealt with. So they don't, they don't want that kind of discrimination. So elites in both parties do not want that kind of discrimination. As a consequence, I think it will not happen. I think Trump may do a lot of talking, but I don't think it will happen. Um, that's the rosiest scenario I can paint you, and I'm an inveterate optimist. It may be, however, that Washington will say, not our thing, let the states do what they want to do, and then states will have a free reign. On immigration, I'm afraid it's a very different story. I think I expect some very, very harsh times for, um, for people without papers. I think that's going to be very, very difficult. But again, I could be wrong. I showed you the numbers. Rounding up millions of people, uh, which could very well happen, you could have a real police presence. Um, you know, I have enough students who are, don't have papers themselves that I'm you know, very much on one side on this particular issue, so it's, it's heartbreaking for me. I'll just come forward and tell you how I feel about that. I'm sure some of you will disagree with me on, on this one thing, but I do think we'll see at least for a year or so um, a very difficult time. But I think it will end. I think the fear of a backlash amid a growing uh, immigrant presence, not just Latino, but a growing immigrant presence will really push back. George Bush understood and was really good at getting immigrants voting for him, and it looked to me around 2004, if I'd given this lecture then, that he was going to solidify a Republican majority. He also had House, Senate, um, uh, presidency, and the states, and he understood that to keep that in Republican hands, he had to embrace the immigrant community. He was actually very deft at that. A Republican was very deft at it. Uh, Obama disrupted that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Trump has. But I think the natural power of that many people is going to make itself felt, but not in the first year. So I fear hard times. That would be my prediction and not a happy one. Hi. Hi. Um, Oklahoma is under a lot of stress with education. And let's say we just have a traditional republic in four years. What does education maybe see coming down the road for us? That's a, yeah, it's a great question. Um, the Republican dog chased the car. It didn't think it would catch, and it caught it. And now it's got to run the country. Um, for a year, it can make the Republican majority can make lots of noise about deregulating and doing negative things, that is, unpacking and unraveling the Obama legacy, and I expect them to do that, though it'll be more difficult than they expect. And then they will start thinking about the next midterm, and all those people who fell left behind will say, yeah, okay, fewer EPA rules, but I still am in the same situation, and they'll feel enormous pressure. This is always true. When this was true of the Reagan administration, for heaven's sakes, the largest expansion of Medicare in history. Ronald Reagan, remember? He's usually thought of as conservative. And watch it. A year from now, the Republican majority will think, oops, we got to do something. It's not enough to just unravel Obama. Uh, both parties do this. When they first come in, they're just not the other party. Everybody says, thank God, or at least they're the followers. And then they have to do something. What will they do? Education is always the Republican default because you're not giving to people who maybe are, you know, welfare like you're giving to young people to give them an opportunity. That's what Bush went big time on with education. People don't like the results so much, No Child Left Behind, but it was the most, uh, the second most largest expansion into federal uh, influence on education of any presidency uh, and a Republican. I would expect to see Trump in his second year do two things. One, a lot of infrastructure. I know Paul Ryan is already telling him not, but I expect he'll do it. Trump is known for one thing, and that's infrastructure. When New York has a problem, we need a new restaurant in, Taverna, uh, in Central Park. They call Trump. He's really good at that. He, he is. Um, but secondly, education is always the Republican default. It's morally easy because it's about opportunity. So watch. 
Bernie Sanders tapped into the education thing, huge results. This is all future and speculation, but my guess is that a year from now, we're gonna actually see uh, some pretty expansive education so that next election, when Republicans are running, they can say, no, 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 we did all this for education. So hang on for another year. Help is coming. I actually think that's a pretty good prediction. Yes. So uh, can you all introduce yourselves? I'm sorry, I should have asked this <laughs> earlier. My name is Sophia Babb. I'm the editor at the newspaper here oh. at the school. Thank the you media. so much for coming here. Um, if our generation is not sharing the same traditional values as the baby boomers, our parents, or our grandparents, um, where is this open-minded, uh, more progressive outlook that millennials have coming from? You know, you can, you can probably answer that better than I can. What I do is spend a lot of time poring over public opinion polls, and um, the, the values, and you can track values across how baby boomers felt and so forth, and we see a number of things happening in the boomer generation. One is a dislike of conflict. Uh, no, I, not sure what it is. Some of my colleagues say it's the child-rearing parents of pattern, uh, habits of my generation. I don't actually believe that we should take credit for it. But, and we see lots of implications from a generation that does not like conflict. One is, as a group, millennials are abandoning organized religion larger than any group in American history. Uh, a third of them say we're nuns, uh, not, uh, not Roman Catholic nuns, N-O-N-E-S. We don't believe, we believe in God, but we don't believe in any religion. Why? Because religion became conflictual in their youth. They are abandoning the political parties. If you ask the millennials, they'll say over 50% will say, I don't like either political party. By the way, people who say they're independents are liars. Sorry, I know I got, I got a lot. Most of them are Democrats or Republicans in, in sheep's clothing. I'm sorry, I've just called the entire generation a liar. But it remains true, millennials don't like parties because parties seem full of conflict and stuff. Um, why that, and, and uh, things like same-sex marriage is another form of tolerance. One explanation that's often given is that this is a generation that doesn't have the same kind of acquisitive sense that capitalism has changed in a way, perhaps because of the rising inequality, perhaps the lowered social mobility, for whatever reason, you're more into um, uh, an Uber or a not owning a car. Now, I don't know if this is true in Oklahoma City, but stunningly true among my students. A lot of people who just, you know, they just borrow their wheels or rent their wheels all the time. So much less acquisitive. So it is a very different generation. Much higher uh, population of immigrants in the generation. Maybe that's affecting the results. Uh, much more diverse, but much more tolerant. And I'm talking a lot about this because I don't know why. I'll have to think about that. When I, if you invite me back, I'll have an answer. Oh, maybe you had someone else. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I, I tore the microphone from whoever you are. Uh, my name is John, and uh, political science major as well. Um, I usually vote Democrat, especially from the city where I'm from. I'm originally from Las Vegas, and, and I grew up in South Central LA. And uh, when I came out to Oklahoma, I kind of changed my thought and my view due to the progressive rhetoric that, that comes out of, of a lot of people from the left. A lot of it is, if you disagree with me, we're gonna shut you down. Now, well, among my circle of friends, that was a huge issue on why they voted for Trump, even though they used to be Democrats. So the ideas of free thought and intellectual diversity, which currently looks like for progressives and such, is not a huge deal. They wish to have diversity, but not intellectual diversity. Do you think that could be a huge deal coming forward for, for people who want to vote? Because that was a huge issue. The economy was one, but that was a huge issue coming, coming from a lot of my friends, a lot of people from, who are out there on the left, that the rhetoric was terrible from the left, worse than the right. One of the really interesting things is how both sides feel the other side is intolerant. And no very few people, you're an exception, no very few people on the other side, but if you take uh, 100 people in Cambridge, they will say that there is an intolerance, exactly what you're, what you're talking about, a great intolerance on the, on the other side. And I, 
Uh, and, and that's true for Democrats and it's true for Republicans. They both, feel the, uh, they, both feel, they both feel that way. And there's a few reasons. One, the racial dimension. Once we separated by race, it moralizes everything. Second, I think to go back to something I said earlier, the fact that elections have been so close um, has made, and I'll say another word about this. So I said close elections make the two sides hate each other more, but it's more. It used to be the leaders of each side got along. There used to be a bar in Congress right between the House and the Senate called the hole in the wall. And you could denounce someone politely. Uh, my esteemed senator from Oklahoma has his head stuck in you know what if he's voting for this bill, but then they go drink bourbon. And they talk and, they, and it's, ah, you got me pretty good this time, but wait, wait till next week, I'm gonna slam you. And they were friends and that filtered down. Now, there are 100 plus members of Congress who don't even have rent quarters in Congress. So they sleep on their couches or cots and they fly in on Tuesday, they fly out on Thursday, they don't even know each other. And elections are so close, they despise each other. And that derision at the top has filtered through the American public. The people generally started out like, no, no, I'm fine. Uh, I, I know lots of Republicans. But the leaders got really nasty with one another, and then the public did. So what you are hearing is one side of a terrible story that started with our leaders and came, because they wanted to win, and came down. You have felt it from the progressives. You could, you, there are other places where you could feel it. You know, my town of Lemster, New Hampshire, up in New Hampshire, it's all Trump. Uh, and uh, I sometimes, I mean, they keep me around as the sort of closet, you know, PhD guy. But, you know, if I were a local guy, I would feel it on the other side. It's a terrible thing about American politics. I keep trying in my textbook to get people to go talk to someone who disagrees with them. And I just think it would be great for America if everybody was required once a month to have someone from the other side over for dinner. Um, it would just transform everything. So maybe you guys can start that. If... Great questions, by the way. Hi. My name is Ija Tuba. I'm from West Africa, Sierra Leone. And I'm a resident in the United States. But my biggest fear is being a Muslim in the United States based on what Donald Trump ran his election, saying he's going to send Muslims back to where they're from. And I have children here already in the United States. And their biggest fear when they come home from school is mommy. Are we going to go back to Africa one of these days since Donald Trump is a president? So I'm just wondering, what do you think Donald Trump is going to do about the Muslims in America? Yeah, I think that's such an important question about um, Muslims. And I think it's going to be a hard year. And I'm sorry for that. Um, but I will say that the fear of people who are different has, goes back to 1630. 1636, when we put the first immigration restrictions in, that the United States, because it believed it was an exceptional nation, a city on the hill, where it just had, was an example for the world, every time someone with different uh, perceptions, different religion, different ideas came on board, there was a huge rev revulsion. Oh my God, they're Roman Catholics. Everyone knew Roman Catholics could not be uh, Americans. Why? Because Americans had revolted against England, the king, just the way Protestants had revolted against the Pope. So you had to have that spirit. The Irish Catholics, first they drank like fish, they fought, they were nasty, and they believed in the Pope. They couldn't, and so Americans uh, were just tore themselves in knots. State after state. Massachusetts passed a law that said you, it was 14 years before you could be naturalized. The revulsion was enormous. But you know what? The American system is one always of integration, of change. It is our salvation. If there's one thing to take away today, it's that immigration is not the problem. It's the solution. That poor Europe is going downhill because its population is too old. Poor China had this one child policy, it's killing them. So now this whole huge population is aging out and the Indians are saying the future's ours. We never did anything that stupid. We, like Europeans, 
uh, did not, people when they get to a certain uh, income level tend not to have uh, 2.0 or more children per, uh, per, per, uh, per couple. They tend not to reproduce themselves, so de uh, demographics go down. Immigration has saved us from that. The United States is deeply powerful immigrant nation. So the good news in the long run is that Muslims, I think, are just like Irish Catholics, are just like Jews, are just like Italian Catholics, are just like, I keep falling off the stage, are just like so many other groups that have come and people say, oh my God, we don't recognize those values. But each has transformed the United States. And it's scary for the old Americans because the face of what it looks like to be an American changes every generation. So you and your children are changing what it is to be an American. My dad went to Colombia on the Italian immigrant quota, and, and this is before World War II, and he went to a frat that only accepted Italians and Jews, and they used to talk about the Americans as opposed to them, because they weren't Americans, they were Italians. And then World War II came along, and everybody was American. And that same process happens generation after generation. Benjamin Franklin himself said there are too many Germans Dutch, he called them. In Philadelphia, they'll ruin the city. They, they don't work. They're lazy. And they speak German. And they, their religion is different, too. Uh, he was a Quaker, of course, and they weren't. Um, he really hated it. And about 10 years later, he said, I was wrong. Uh, 1652, there's this horrible diatribe against Germans. Um, so bad news. Uh, Americans have always been worried about new groups coming in and there's always a backlash. Once in a while, that backlash hits po politics, and Donald Trump did that backlash. That's the, even if you're a supporter, that one, that's, a, that's a difficult part to swallow. So for the next year, I think things will be hard for your kids. But you will win. Uh, us foreigners always win, because America is a nation of foreigners. So if you were born abroad, I mean, 60 million people have parents who were born abroad. That, that's huge um, and, uh, and growing all the time. So the notion that the United States will stop somehow being an immigrant nation is just not what the United States is. Now, it may be that we'll want to change our immigration policies. Almost everybody does. But all nations adjust immigration policies. Making people who are here, who are in effect Americans, um, safe and feeling um, welcomed, uh, feeling valued is the word, um, is not so important. And it's something that happens. It happens inevitably, like a machine. It's happened for 300 years. As I say, the first restrictions were 1636. They were worried that antinomians would come to Boston. Don't, don't ask what an antinomian is, but they were worried about them. Um, so short answer, short term, trouble. Long term, by which I mean two or three years, you'll be fine. We have time for one, more. one more. One more. Really quick you, you, you pick them. One more really quick question. Okay, and a quick answer, yes. Just scream. Yeah. You no way we didn't talk about gender. Okay, great question. Um, very short answer, societies that try apartheid must have sexism. If you're going to take different groups aside, you're going to put a lot of pressure on women because if our women date their men, our apartheid is gone. So we have this long tradition. I, um, the, the, there is no issue that gender doesn't touch. I wrote one book, Hellfire Nation, and um, it was about the Puritan tradition. And I saw right away all this stuff about gender in 1630s. And the more I wrote, the more I saw. And I'd go to some of my colleagues who study gender, and I'd say, wow, look at this. And they'd go, duh, you know, welcome to the real world. Gender is deep, it's powerful, and it's particularly powerful in the United States because all this stuff we've been talking about with race and immigration, we're also talking gender. Um, whose family is privileged? who is in, who is out, insofar as we make families across these lines, 
we blow up the whole set of differences we're talking about, going right back to the first question. But the result is that we put enormous um, set of values and pressures and troubles on gender itself. So gender is an incredibly freighted category. Whole different lecture, and I wish I could talk about it more, but I'm seeing the hook. So that's a great question, and thank you for asking it. I should have brought it up a lot more. Let's say thank you to Professor Moran. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great lecture, very informative and uh, very thought-provoking. I'm sure it will, it will be the catalyst for much discussion, particularly in our political science classes. Uh, Dr. Vaughn has uh, several comments, and I'll close this. Uh. First of all, thank everyone for coming. This is amazing turnout. And I want to thank Craig Barrett and Tony Mathias from Oxford University Press. Um, they made this possible. Come on, guys. Oxford. And for you students who have a blue piece of paper, five of you have a dot on the blue piece of paper, and you have just won a wonderful book from Oxford University Press. So if you have the dot, go back and see Dr. Tabor. Dean Tabor has the books, and you have just won a book. Thank you again, Oxford University Press, okay? And finally, we got something, this is just a gift from OCCC to say thank you. It's from the Oklahoma Memorial Museum. I wanted to take you there last night, but you were in Detroit, so <laughs> that's how that goes. But anyway, thank you very much oh, for coming. Pleasure, we're so pleasure. excited to have you here. Thank you. Dr. Moran, once again, we thank you for being with us. Uh, your lecture was extraordinarily informative and interesting. Thanks to each of you for being here as well. And I want to close with, with one final comment. <clears throat> I've, been in, I've been involved in the political life of this uh, city and state uh, all of my adult life. Uh, we have come through uh, the most contentious uh, election uh, in my lifetime, the presidential election. Um, and I... I know that in this room there are strong feelings on both sides of the election. Uh, some are very happy that uh, uh, President-elect Trump won and others are very sad that, that he won. But I want to encourage you as you go about your business here at the college, whether you're a student, faculty, staff, or visitor, to um, not trying to influence your opinion at all, but I hope that we can uh, uh, talk with each other civilly and treat each other with respect as we go throughout this uh, remaining part of this, the aftermath of the campaign and then the, um, the inauguration of President-elect Trump on January 20th. Uh, I, again, I'm not trying to say don't, don't feel strongly about your opinion, but, but I do hope on our campus uh, and in our community that we can set the standard for at least a reasonable and civil discussion uh, with those with whom we may disagree. Thanks again for coming.